I'm going to talk about something I've never talked about in meditation before that I can remember. It's an interesting topic. Usually, the last Thursday, we do a long meditation. We've got a lot of new people, and I have this idea, so I'm going to talk for a little bit more than I normally do on the last Thursday of the month. But I had this fun thing that happened when I was teaching class on Saturday in the park. And in the park, we get people, they come by and they watch class all the time. And some people have done martial arts and they ask us about it. Or some people are interested. And we get a lot of people who are like, that looks really cool. I'm going to try it. And they'll come in and do class. And we'll get some people every once in a while who just yell at us. And they'll yell all kinds of stuff. It's not usually nice stuff. Usually people are like heckling us. That's yours right there. Great. Go ahead. So... Uh, and I've had this happen countless times at our school in Michigan, where my Sifu still teaches, we do our weapons class outside on the street on Woodward. And if you've ever been to Michigan around Detroit, Woodward is like the biggest, it's like the, it's almost like the 10 here. It's like the, the big street that runs through everything. And uh, we're out there and we get like 80,000 cars driving by every single day and we're out there with weapons and every like minute somebody's driving by going rolling down the window hi yeah and people are like yelling at us and it's very interesting it's a fun thing to deal with when you're trying to focus on something that's really hard and people are yelling at you and so I wanted to talk about this idea of being heckled being heckled is something that's going to happen sometimes in our martial arts practice, but some version of this will happen to us in our daily life. And I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. So this Saturday, I was teaching, we were teaching a silent class. And so it was very obvious when this gentleman who walked over and put his cane next to him, kind of leaned back on the chair and I'm teaching a, a joint lock, this, this chin all called Sankyu, and, he's, and he yells and he's like, what would happen if somebody threw an elbow in there? Uh, but he did it with a very old man voice because he's a very old man. And I walk over to him and I'm like, sorry, sir, we're doing a silent class right now. And he continues to ask me questions kind of loudly, but a little bit more quietly. And we have a whole long conversation and he gives me his card at the end. And I realized that we had been visited by Sifu Evil Master Fang, which is written on his card. And Sifu Evil Master Fang, I've not heard of, but maybe you guys have heard of him. I think if you Google him, he might have a website. In any case, he, we had a, a perfectly fine conversation. We exchanged you know, ideas on what martial arts should be like, et cetera, et cetera. And I wouldn't call this a true heckling. It was kind of close, but it's not even, not even close to how bad I've seen it before. Uh, I want to tell a couple of stories about being heckled in different possible responses, but I also want to talk about like why it, is, why it can feel rough, why we have this emotional response to it. And it's a little bit different from when somebody just like face to face when you're just, you know, in a small group or having a conversation with somebody, when somebody tells you something that, you know, they're making fun of you or they're telling you that you're wrong, that by itself kind of sucks. But when it happens in front of a group of people, that's its own other world. And it can be quite distressing. You're thinking about, I'm looking dumb in front of all these people, especially if you're like the teacher and somebody's yelling something at you. You can start to think like, well, now this is undermining my authority. And you start thinking all this stuff that is not really helpful. But this, this uh, experience of getting heckled, whether you're teaching or you're in a group of people or you're just out there and somebody's driving by and yelling out their window, you're going to experience something like this. And just like I was saying in the last class, while this sounds like a bad thing, of course, somebody says something that's mean to you. Somebody yells at you or they call you out in front of a bunch of people. It seems like a bad thing. And of course, on some level, it is. But it can also be an opportunity. Now, on the most basic level, anything, and this is going to sound like kind of a cop-out explanation, but anything bad that happens to us is an opportunity for us to work on dealing with that. Uh, you can think of this on like a karmic level where it's like 
you must have bad karma if this bad thing is happening to you. So this is an opportunity for you to deal with it and get past your bad karma. You can think of it on a psychological level or an interpersonal level. This is a thing that's happening. And if it happens often enough, it's a sign that you really need to be able to deal with it. And especially if it really hits you hard, you realize this is obviously something that is an opportunity that I need to take rather than being hit by it and just like laid out and like, I don't know how to handle this. This is bad. We kind of use it. And it's like I was saying at the end of the last class, if we have a different kind of mindset, if we shift our mindset, even somebody heckling us can be an opportunity to learn, to get better, or even maybe form a relationship with somebody, even if it's Sifu, evil, master, fang. So the people who are best at dealing with hecklers, well, that's not probably true, but the people who have to deal with hecklers the most, I think are stand-up comedians. Now, if you watch a really good stand-up comedian, somebody heckles them, they turn it into a great part of the show. This comedian is not like, oh, somebody's heckling me. I need to leave right now. now. I'm sure some people do, and they don't last very long as comedians, I would assume. But a really good person in stand-up is like, oh, great. I'm going to take this and turn it into a great opportunity. Maybe I'll call this person out. Maybe I'll make friends with them. There are lots of different ways that this can go. But it requires a nimble mind. It requires a mindset that's like, no, I'm in charge here. You think that you can mess with me, but truly, you're just walking into my world. You think that you're taking me off my game, but actually what you're doing is giving me an opportunity to, to kind of massage this and play with it. Uh, I'll give some examples from me and from my Sifu. We are not stand-up comedians. Sometimes my meditation talk can seem like I'm trying to do stand-up. I'm not. I'm trying to do sit-down. But... But I'm bummed. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, so I'll give an example that happened to me. This was at our first location down the street. We had class going on one night. It was like six people, not a huge class. And I noticed somebody standing outside. It's kind of like if they were standing outside this window right here. We had our bonsai sitting outside on a nice little bench. And this guy was standing out there smoking a cigarette, like ashing his cigarette into the bonsai trees and smoking again. And I'm looking at this guy just doesn't look quite right. And sure enough, he proved me right. Because after about 10 minutes of watching, he flings open the door, he walks in, and he's disheveled. He's got a, an appearance of this man has not slept in a bed for quite some time. He's got a big bushy beard and he's got a medical bracelet on. So he goes, I heard... You MFers, he used the real word, not the abbreviation, wanted to fight me. And this is an interesting move, going into a martial arts school, trying to start a fight, and one that actually happens pretty often. Uh, it hasn't happened in exactly that way before with us, but there have been people who have come in, and you can kind of tell that they are maybe looking for a fight, and maybe they're looking to spend the night in jail or the hospital, or maybe they're like really trying to do it. And this was a thing that used to happen all the time back in the day, dojo raiding. People would come in, and sometimes they'd be from another school, they'd be wearing the shirt from another school, but they'd be in there like trying to start a fight. And it's like, my style is better than your style, my teacher's better than your teacher, and it's like, we don't do that anymore because we're civilized. We have insurance. Somebody comes in and they're like, we want to start a fight. I'm like, well, you know, sign this waiver and then please leave. Also, we're calling the police. So what happened in this case, I'm digressing. This guy goes, I heard you wanted to fight me. And what I did was not like the perfect response. It was just the thing that came to my mind in the moment. I was like, sir, please, we have class going on right now. And that's just because we're having class. And, and he's like, well, how long is that going to be? And I say, I look at the clock and I say about a half an hour. And, and he goes, oh yeah, well now how long is it going to be? And I say, still a half an hour. And he goes, Jesus. And he storms out and he never comes back. And that was the end of it. And I've heard lots of fun stories that martial arts teachers or experienced martial artists like to tell dealing with somebody who's trying to start something. You've heard me say some of them if you come to the self-defense seminar that we do. It's, you know, along the lines of somebody's like starting a fight and you go like, where'd you get that shirt? 
I really like that shirt. And at the very least, it kind of throws them off, makes them think about something other than what they're trying to do. And you might be able to turn it into a friendly conversation. Uh, or they might just leave, right? In this kind of case where somebody is not just heckling you, but they're like kind of trying to threaten you with physical violence, uh, it doesn't help to be afraid. It doesn't help to kind of become small. Some people, some people like to say that what you should do is become really big, be very loud and try to scare them. And that can work, but it also can provoke it. So in my experience, it's better to just kind of play with it like we do in push hands and Tai Chi, right? The energy comes and you just play with it. Uh, this is kind of like what happened when we had another guy walk into our school in Michigan. This guy also looked and smelled like he had not been sleeping in a bed for a while. And he sat right next to my seafood. This was after classes. He walks in. It's like, it's Michigan. So for half the year, it's snowing and it's cold out. And he comes in with his jacket and his gloves and he takes his gloves off and he's sitting right next to my Sifu who's, who's like putting his shoes on. And I'm behind the desk. I'm working in the dojo at this point. And he starts asking me about questions. And it becomes very clear that this man is not interested in taking classes. This man is interested in starting a fight or trying to, you know, start some kind of a, an emotional situation. And he's uh, basically saying, he's like talking trash about our school or our Sifu. He doesn't know anything about any of it, but he's just like saying stuff, right? As people do when they don't know stuff, they say stuff. And... I'm like listening to him and I'm like, well, I can tell this is no good. So I just, I say, you know what? Our classes are all full right now, but here's our, here's our information and have a great day. And he goes, okay, but if you see me in here next week, just beating the absolute something bad word out of your teacher, you'll remember me. And my Sifu is sitting right next to him and the guy like stands up to go and Sifu Brown's like, you forgot your glove and he just hands him the glove and the guy just is like, thanks. He walks out and leaves and we never see him again either. Uh, this is like, you want to, you want to be kind of dealing with these situations from a standpoint, not of like, I know that I can beat this person up because that's what a lot of people think that confidence comes from in martial arts or in life. That is, it's not real confidence and it's not really useful. Being able to beat somebody up is useful if you are a professional fighter or if you work, if you are in a line of work where you constantly have to be getting into it with people. That's not even me, right? Uh, I let other people spar and I just stand here and yell at them and it's easy, right? Uh, but like for most of us in our daily life, we can't get out of it by intimidating people, by beating them up. It's much more about being able to take their energy and play with this. So I always say, I mean, a lot of people bring their kids in to learn confidence or adults come in to learn confidence. And I say real confidence is, is actually about trying something that you're bad at, getting better at it, realizing that when you put effort into something, you can improve, you can get better. And then you start to apply that to other things. That's confidence. Confidence is knowing that you might not be good at this yet, but you can get good at it, Right. Confidence is knowing that even though this person might kind of have it out for you, you can kind of just be okay with it because you know that you have this kind of deep self-confidence. If you can imagine yourself being like a, a comedian and somebody starts to heckle you, if you don't have the confidence to deal with that, it goes south real fast. It's the same thing in any situation in life. You have to have that kind of base of confidence. Uh, this can extend into so many different things. I'll use an example that I just used so much last week in my talk, but I talk about it all the time because we all can appreciate traffic in LA. It's something that we deal with every single day. You're driving, somebody cuts you off. If you don't have the confidence or the strong base, that strong sense of self that allows you to just be okay with somebody cutting you off and you don't take it personally, if you don't have that strong base, then of course the thing that you automatically do is you step on the gas and you try to cut them off. Or at the very least you get angry, you start you know, driving erratically yourself. And 
this is when people get hurt. This is when people are dangerous on the street. But imagine that every time somebody cuts you off, the first thing you realize is, well, that person must be in a hurry. Something, something important must be happening. Maybe they've got somebody who's giving birth in the car. That's the one that I always go to. Maybe they're really late for their first job interview and they got to get there. They need this job. And it does not take much for me to remember the last time that I cut somebody off. It was not years ago. And if you can remember the last time you did something that this jerk is doing, then it can kind of give you the empathy to deal with it. And this is really important to be able to deal with people, to be able to deal with hecklers. Maybe you've never heckled somebody before, but you've done something similar to it. And you can just recognize that this person is going through something. Maybe they're trying to impress somebody right now. Maybe they just feel bad about themselves and that's why they're kind of entering into this strange set of circumstances where they're trying to start a fight in a martial arts school. <laughs> Uh, whatever's going on, there's something that you can in some way relate to. And this is it, right? So we practice in the dojo, we practice being partners, not opponents. And it seems like a very simple semantical kind of shift, but it is absolutely life-changing and world-altering. If you start to recognize that even that person cutting you off is a partner, not an opponent, even this person in class who's trying to hit you is a partner, you recognize your best partners are the ones that are challenging you the most. The person who doesn't just like take it really easy on you, but they're really trying to push you. That's your best partner because they are making you better. They're giving you the opportunity to grow. And when we can apply that to other people out there in the rest of the world, that state of mind or that kind of attitude that we have about other people now makes it very easy to deal with whatever weird energy they're throwing at us, right? So for me personally, somebody walks into the dojo, they're starting something or they're talking trash, they're heckling me. I'm always like, oh, this person must be interested in martial arts. Let me talk to them about what we do and try to make them become a student. I don't know if I've ever gotten anybody, but it makes the conversation a lot more pleasant. And of course, if somebody's like really trying to be dangerous, I kind of keep my distance, but there's no need to let it turn into, I always say it takes two people to fight. Uh, if you, I mean, if you watch Fight Club, no spoilers, but I guess you could make an argument that it only takes one person to fight, but it takes two people really in this situation. If one person is mad, the other person just walks away, there's no fight. And we're talking about a physical fight or an emotional fight, a verbal fight, so, you know, when this person cuts you off or when this person looks at you funny, eh, you can take it personally. You can make it mean something that is like, I've got to fight this person now, even if it's just going off on them verbally or emotionally. Or you can take that to mean like this person's having a rough day. I recognize this because I've had lots of partners in the dojo and in life who are having a rough day and they might really just need a great workout, a great class right now. They might really just need somebody to just be there with them and kind of understand what they're going through. A uh, great story about this is, I'll tell the version that I heard and I've heard slightly different variations of it, but let's say this is in Japan, it's an Aikido student. And uh, this Aikido student is sitting on the train when this guy gets on the train and he starts knocking into people and yelling at people. And he's clearly like looking for a fight. And this Aikido student is like, yes, this is my chance. I've been training for years and I finally get to show my stuff. Not only that, but it's going to be in front of this group of people. I'm going to look like a hero. It's going to be incredible. And so he's like waiting. He's just waiting for this guy to make it to him, for this guy to like shove him and for him to like spring into action. And before this gentleman who's going through something makes it all the way to this Aikido student's seat on the train. He hears from over on this side of the train, an old man's voice, friend, have you been drinking sake? I love sake. 
come over and talk to me. And so this guy is like very taken aback. This is not what he expected to happen in this situation. He walks over and he's like, sit here, talk to me. And, and this guy just, just talks to him and finds out what's going on. And this Aikido student is listening. He realizes that this guy is has just gone, gone out and drunk as much as he possibly can because his wife just died. And he is just beside himself with, with sadness and fear and didn't know how to handle it. And this is where he finds himself. And so by the end of the, you know, when they get to their stop, the guy's like got his head on the old man's shoulder and he's just weeping. And of course the Aikido student kind of slinks off the train thinking like, if my sensei knew what I was about to do to that guy, he would think that I'm an idiot. And this is something that you don't have to practice martial arts to get. Of course, it's nice to have that like, you know, physical sense of like, I know that I'm solid. I know I can handle it, but it's much more important to have that uh, emotional and just kind of solid sense of self where you know that in any situation, you don't have to turn it into a fight. It doesn't have to turn into something that is negative. It can always be spun in a way that. If you play with the energy, there's something good that can come out of it. I think that's everything that I had written down. I didn't even have to look at my tiny sheet one time. Yep. That's it. I nailed it. So we're going to meditate. And when you meditate, there's going to be no talking going on here, as I mentioned before. But you will have a heckler. You will have the worst heckler that you ever deal with in your entire life. That is the ego, the small self that lives inside your mind. And this heckler is going to be telling you all kinds of nonsense while you're meditating. They're going to tell you, you can't meditate. You're garbage. You keep thinking, why can't you do this? Uh, they're going to be thinking about all the dumb things that you did today. Your, your inner heckler is going, to be, is going to be time traveling back to when you were a child and making you relive the dumbest things, the greatest hits of the biggest mistakes that you've made in your entire life. And then you're going to let that go and your inner heckler is going to take you into the future. And it's going to be thinking about all the dumb things that you're going to do tomorrow and all the dumb things that you're going to do making mistakes for the rest of your life. And my C always said this, that you talk to yourself worse than you would ever let anybody else talk to you. You'd be getting into a fight with somebody else if they talk to you the way that you do. So that voice, that ego, that little self, that little voice inside you who's like a little child in the back of the, the, back of the car who keeps going, are we there yet? Why can't you drive faster? You're so bad. That little voice is an opportunity. And it is absolutely imperative that we see that voice in that way. Because if we see or hear our inner voice, that heckler, as something to fight against, then meditation feels like a fight. And meditation can, but does not need to, be a fight. Meditation should very much feel like a relaxing experience. So when you have a thought, instead of fighting against it, let it go. Uh, the question of the week in the dojo is what role does surrender play in your practice? And I'll tell you that surrender must play a huge role in your meditation. Uh, not surrendering to just being bad at meditation. Of course, you need to accept where you are tonight. And however much you're thinking and however much you're stressing during your meditation tonight is perfect. It's exactly where you're supposed to be right now. And... You can, with that acceptance, let it go. That's distinct. That's different from accepting that you are nothing more than your ego or that little self or that heckler, right? You are more than that. You are beyond that. So when you can let that go in that moment and surrender to the breath, surrender to this breath in this moment, nothing else matters. That's how you let that little voice disappear. And you're going to have to do that a lot, <laughs> This is what we're practicing in meditation. We're practicing letting go of ego thinking, of ego identification. We're practicing letting go of that inner heckler and just returning back to the breath. If you feel like you are trying to fight the heckler, it's exactly what they want. Your ego wants it to be a fight. 
Your ego wants to brawl with you when you're trying to meditate because your ego does not like it when you meditate because it's ego death. So what you can do is you can hear that little voice. You can be like, that's cute. That's my ego trying to mess with me right now. I'm just going to let that go and come back to this breath. So fighting feels hard. Fighting feels stressful. Meditation doesn't need to feel stressful. Surrender. Letting go of that by returning to the breath. It's not necessarily going to feel easy, but it's going to feel much more enjoyable than trying to fight against yourself. So one of the ways you can do this is when you recognize you have some kind of chatter going on in your mind, you can just label it by saying the word thought in your mind quietly to yourself. If you start talking during meditation, you'll mess up everybody else. And then return to the breath and make the very next breath that you return to feel like you're coming home. You want this breath to feel like you were just gone on a very stressful work trip or, you know, a vacation that was also very stressful and you're returning home after being gone for a long time and you walk in the door, you drop your stuff and you just plop on your couch and it's like, ah, finally, everything's okay. So if you can make returning to your breath feel like that, feel like returning home after a long trip, then that will be very enticing for you. And you are actually setting yourself up for success because it's an enjoyable thing rather than recognizing the, the thought and fighting against it. We're giving ourselves positive feedback. We are reinforcing it positively by making that breath very enjoyable. So sit comfortably. I'm going to talk about different ways to sit. So I sit in Seiza because my knees like this the most. You can also sit cross-legged. If you're going to sit Seiza on this thing, I like to stand it up on its side to make it a little bit higher. Cross-legged is wonderful if you can sit cross-legged on the cushion without your knees sticking up. If your knees stick up higher than your hips, then in a longer meditation, your legs are going to start to fall asleep. So you guys all look pretty good. Yeah, turn that thing up on its side tie like this. So it's like a sideways donut. Yep, and then you can just sit on it with your legs on either side of it. So like this with that thing right in between you. Or you can sit cross like it like this. Either one is fine. So your spine is straight. This is very important. Try to avoid sitting against a wall unless you have to. If you have to, okay. But you want your hands here. They can be together or separate. If you have them facing down, this has a tendency to, they say this is like closing off your energy, but also you might start to slide down and that creates a slouch. So we want the hands here and then rolling your shoulders back. Your shoulders are relaxed. You're not trying to pinch your shoulder blades. You just have a nice comfortable position. Your chin is parallel to the ground. So we're not craning the neck in either direction. You do this, you're going to fall asleep or fall over. You do this, your neck is going to hurt or you're going to have weird blood flow. So your spine is just stacked gently, one vertebra on top of the next. And close eyes. So while there are styles of meditation with the eyes open, we like to do this with the eyes closed. And your eyes are gently raised up to the point between the eyebrows. This is distinct from crossing your eyes. If you cross your eyes, you will get a headache. So your eyes are just naturally raising up slightly. And a lot of people have a difficult time getting this position in the beginning. So a couple of things you can do to help. One is you can actually just touch your third eye right basically on the center of your forehead with your finger and then feel that spot. You're not trying to look at it by just feeling that spot on your forehead, your eyes will naturally start to rise up. Where your attention goes, your eyes will start to go. If that doesn't work for you, you can actually open your eyes and look at something out in the distance that is above your head. And then you can close your eyes and you've got that same raised gaze. So this is important because it helps us to associate this position with a raised consciousness. It helps us not fall asleep. And from here, we're going to begin with a couple of deep breaths together. So start with all the breath out. <sighs> Breathe in through the nose. 
Hold it for a few seconds at the top and then breathe out. You can breathe out through the nose or the mouth. Always breathe in through the nose. Hold it for about three seconds at the top and out. Breathe from the belly. So as you inhale, your belly should be expanding as your diaphragm does its thing. And as you exhale, your belly sinks back in, contracting. Try to move your chest very little. Try to make the breath from the belly nice and deep. So that deep, calm, relaxed breath from the belly is going to cause your mind to relax. Do a couple more deep breaths where you're actively trying to breathe deeply. You're actively holding the breath at the top for a few seconds. And then exhale completely. If you need to, you can count in your mind as you inhale and you can count the seconds of the breath. Try to breathe in for five to 10 seconds and then breathe out for the same amount of time. Do one more deep breath. And finish with a double exhalation. Then you're gonna let the breath come in by itself. And then let the breath go out by itself. So now we're no longer trying to manipulate the breath. There's no judgment. You're just allowing the breath to come in and go out by itself. When your mind wanders, bring it gently back to the breath. Again, if you need to label a thought by saying to yourself, thought, that's a great way of letting it go. There's no judgment. Not beating yourself up for having a thought. You're just returning back to the breath. And if you notice that you have a really difficult time focusing on the breath, And you can add a visualization to it. So as you inhale, you can imagine yourself being filled with water or light, just visualizing a color of the air. You can imagine the air going back out with a visualization. Ultimately, you want to be able to let go of all of that and just feel the breath. And when you're feeling the breath, you can feel it from the belly as it rises and falls. You can feel the air passing through your throat or your nose. Try to be consistent and just keep your attention on that one spot. If you lose your posture, just gently straighten your spine, and raise your eyes up again, and continue surrendering to the breath. <sighs> 